And thank you to the panel for actually also being here. Um, I'm Eva Parson, I'm from the Buffer Alliance, European Anti Poverty Network, Norway. And I'm just opening this session and uh, leaving the virtual room afterwards. But first, I will also say that important to us is to find the solution for us to reach our goal. Have a wealthy society that leaves no one behind. Thank you, and Bruna. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eva. Uh, so, my name is Bruna uh, Alisson, working at the Center for Open University. Very welcome to all of you to this uh, uh, session called From Safety Net to Income Floor. Uh, um, uh, this panel will discuss uh, to what extent it is. Uh, a universal unconditional welfare for all is a realistic objective for uh, or in the Nordic uh, welfare states, given the uh, external pressures on the, the, on the Nordic model, given, for instance, uh, the increasing globalization and also the, 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 the demographic aging. Uh, people have questioned whether the Nordic model is sustainable. And, um, and uh, in this context, we will discuss the possible uh, future for more universalistic, unconditional minimum uh, income protection for, for all. Uh, we will have um, uh, start by brief uh, 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 presentations by each of um, the panelists, followed by a QA session. And um, let me introduce to you uh, the panelists. Uh, we have uh, in pink or red, uh, Marvin Björnbold, research professor at the Norwegian Center for Violence and uh, Traumatic Stress Studies. We have the uh, closest here to my right, Eva, Professor Ivan Gerbener, professor in social policy at Oslo Metropolitan University. Colin Mulder, uh, professor of economics at the University of Oslo. Uh, to my very uh, far end here. <coughs> Uh, affiliated research professor from the Rocken Center in Bergen, and finally, uh, least but not uh, finally, but not least, uh, Kisi Drinke, who is a social worker here representing the International Conference for Social Welfare, and also which is also a member of the Welfare Alliance. Um, and with that, I suggest we just start from, if it's okay, I'm good, that we start from Nathan. Yeah, and then we <coughs> have maximum 10 minutes uh, each, and I'll uh, and I'll have to be very specific on time, so I'll have a case on the floor. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, hello everybody, thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is a very good conference, I think. I'll uh, talk about the Nordic Grateful States and the University of A core difference between various uh, kind of welfare states are the uh, different uh, the difference in, uh, um, distribution of welfare resources and distinctive in the Nordic model is that the right the rights to these resources are universal meaning that they include the whole uh, population so um, uh, the social security system is uh, comprehensive. Huh? And it is also very generous. Um, it uh, protection to all uh, members of the Nordic societies when a crisis uh, occurs, like unemployment, sickness, old age, and not least disability, etc. Um, as the Nordic welfare state has created a high levels of well-being, income inequality limited poverty and uh, social stability that frequently stand up as models for other social policy in other countries. Uh, and um, the, uh, the economists, uh, especially after the financial crisis in 2008, and the economist has even called the Nordic model for a supermodel. So, welfare models consisting of selective policies 
do not get this attention. Such policies are based either on the principle of targeting, which includes only the poor people of society, or the principle of reciprocity, which includes uh, only those people who have contributed something to society. So, um, consequently, these principles, universalism, targeting, and uh, reciprocity, represent competing principles of the distribution of welfare. And thus, uh, <coughs> the lack of the normative logic of the welfare state, different welfare states. Regarding the idea of universalism, it is clearly closely related to the idea of egalitarianism. In terms of income security, then, the perfect universal allocation of uh, resources is a flat rate basic income and conditionally paid to every member of society. However, this kind of uh, universal um, policy and uh, universal income security is remote from the kind of universal policies that characterize the Nordic welfare state today. More than 70 years after uh, we implemented a child benefit in Norway in 1946, um, the ideas of targeting and reciprocity has become more and more uh, influential in the, both in the discourses but also in the implementation of uh, welfare policies in the Nordic countries. Um, and especially for the uh, benefits in the intersections of welfare and work. Uh, for while the no. while the social policy discourses in the 60s and 70s you're about what kind of individual needs the, the people, the members of society have. The discourses changed in the 80s and 90s to the uh, kind of demands the individual arrest towards the welfare state and their own responsibility uh, for their uh, welfare. The studies of welfare the discourses, uh, the USAD and the EU is a very interesting object. Both are organizations for economic cooperation and development. Both have increasingly directed attention to social policy and issues from the 1980s uh, on. Moreover, as neither of them have the means to put their recommendations on the national agendas, there are no uh, possibilities for that. Their recommendations, um, they have to play what is called the idea game. Uh, so in 1981, the Wizard published the, the report of the Welfare State and Crisis, which was groundbreaking in setting a negative against the Western Welfare State. The Wizard yeah, described this as too extensive, too expensive, yeah. too generous, and too devastating for work ethics. After this publication, all the Welfare States have been exposed to increasing pressure, especially economic pressure. Uh, also the mission was and it still is that the welfare state should restrict their protection uh, policies, especially when they get the section of the referendum. Uh, however, at the same time, the social and economic uh, risks that the welfare state are uh, designed to, to uh, protect the members of society from uh, have been expanding, partly due to dramatic changes in the nature of work and in the regulations of the labor markets. All welfare states have met these new challenges in various, with various kinds of workfare policies with the uh, obligations uh, linked to, uh, to them, increasing uh, obligations. But these have uh, not proven very successful, and uh, they are indeed also humiliating and uh, insulting. Uh, they transform the citizens, as Guy Stanley said in yesterday, indicated yesterday, they transform the citizens into uh, begging uh, uh, persons. Uh, well, there are three, uh, there are, uh, nevertheless, still strong universalistic elements in the Nordic uh, welfare states, 
especially in the health sector, uh, so that the, the universal, universalism may be revived again also in the social security sector. So, and from a new, uh, or restore the normative basis of the Nordic welfare state by uh, introducing a new social security system like a, a universal basic income uh, that treat the citizens with equal concern and respect. Uh, core, that's the core values in the Nordic model. Dignity was an important argument when the universal pension system was implemented in 1957. Dignity was a... Uh, and again, you will have uh, dignity restored in the Nordic welfare model, uh, if you want to know. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I may stop because I understand it's not so easy to uh, to hear in this room, so uh, I try to uh, be more uh, propagating. So uh, I have some uh, specific uh, points uh, I hope they will hear. The first thing is uh, that uh, the, the movement of, of basic income, I think in any society, consists of so diverting, of so diverse interests that I think that is you think that this is a movement that you have a lot of support because they have all different views in, in the same movement. And I think that's wrong. They, they, you will always pick somebody, uh, who, uh, if you are skeptic, you pick somebody with, with a little bit of a, uh, a wrong argument for, for basic income and therefore you, you decline the idea, uh, react the idea yourself. So I think that there are people within the, within the movement, they, they consider basic income as a substitute for the welfare state, for the Nordic welfare state or any welfare state. I think it is a complement. I think it is a complement in the sense that you can strengthen it. So that's my first point. My second point is that, that uh, uh, many think about the defense of the present Nordic system of welfare spending. That is from the social democratic view. But historically, that's not the right thing. Historically, then the, the uh, social democrats they had a targeted program. You take from the rich and give it to the poor, and it should be targeted to the poor. That was the socialist idea for for, for the welfare state. And they changed the policy when they came into power because they nowhere in the world have you had very great support for redistributing schemes like that. So we have compared the people that I work with. I can come back to that if you are interested. Uh, have compared sort of welfare state arrangement over time and across countries, and there are some specific features that are very uh, clear. First of all, it is not targeted welfare systems that benefits the poor the most, because they lack political support. That's the basic idea. Secondly, it is the most gross welfare states that have the most political support and help the most the poor, the worst of segment in society. That is a very clear pattern across the countries and over time. And the basic income idea belongs to this uh, broad-based welfare spending type of uh, uh, arrangement. And we have it today in, in, in sort of in-kind provision. So the step to a basic income idea is to have it more transferred from in-kind provision to in-cash provision. And you can find a new balance there, and I think that is very necessary in my view, and it can be very suitable for, for uh, Nordic welfare states and, and an improvement of, of the system. Uh, third place is that what, what are the arguments? Some people say that well, if you introduce a basic income, then wages will decline. That's been the argument. We have investigated that. It's just the opposite. You introduce, well, you have something similar to. Uh, a basic income that you increase the sort of the flow implicit in the welfare state, you also raise the lowest wages before taxes and transfers. Why is that? Because your basic income is an is problem. You empower people, you empower single mothers, you empower weak groups in the labor market, uh, and they can be, become stronger. So that means that they demand more. And actually, the, the economists talk about uh, specific things elasticity of sort of 
increasing the, the, this floor. It, this is a contour, uh, which is pretty high elasticity in the sense that it transforms into a, also a higher uh, nominal wage. Um, that's uh, one thing. Secondly, uh, and then I think I'm on the fourth argument, uh, and you stop me when this is uh, ended, uh, that is that um, uh, people think that when you, <coughs> when you have a basic income in the bottom of the system, then the, su then the political support for the rest of the welfare state declines, because you know you've already got something. Uh, this is not in accordance with the evidence that you have, comparing over time, in theory, and over, over time, and across countries, also theoretically model, uh, models are uh, supporting this, uh, that uh, the more you have in the bottom, the more political demand there is for other type of redistribution scheme. Here's how it works, and you have to be very brief on this, that it is the bigger the difference between the bottom and the top, the higher the inequalities before taxes and transfers, that many people thought, and socialists thought, I'm a socialist, so I thought it also maybe when I was young, uh, stupid and young, and uh, that the bigger the difference, the more demand for redistribution. It isn't the case. If you compare across countries and over time, the pattern is that the smaller the difference between the top and the bottom before taxes and transfers, the more political support it is for traditional welfare spending. In kind provision, health services, education, all these things. Why is that? It is because they provide normal goods. Normal goods that goes up with the income of, of the recipient, income before taxes and transfer, you would like more of it. Uh, and that, therefore, it's impossible to win elections in, in the Nordic countries without supporting the welfare state. Because people, you have compressed wage differences, that means that you increase the income of the majority in society, and then you support more welfare spending, not less. So again, all these arguments, that uh, they go against the sort of a role of the welfare state. I think they are basically bad arguments. And sometimes they are put forward, in this, as I said in the first argument, by people who would like to replace the welfare state with some, something else. I think they, they, it's quite clear that there is a com strong complementary forces here. And you can only study that by, by, by looking for different changes in the welfare state that you have had in existing arrangement. And of course they haven't been implementing a basic income, but I think the evidence is very clear that it moves in that direction. Thank you. and there are different arguments that need to be made and we have been talking about the need to redefine work. There is actually lots of work in feminist economics that has been grappling with this issue about what is work, what is being valued in the economy and what counts. Uh, and I think this is a very important and valuable argument that we need to, to, to make and uh, think about in order to to, to uh, gain support for, for the idea of the uh, UBI. Um, and here I think uh, the centrality of the year for any economy, as the core of what we are doing, is very important, as it has been argued by feminist economists, feminist philosophers. There is a huge literature on theorizing care. Everything needs care. That's care. If we don't care, there are no human beings, no societies, no machines. Nothing. Nothing can exist without care. And I think this is a very important political act, a political argument. Uh, because we tend to think of care as something uh, that we do uh, uh, beside the really important things. But that is not the case. This is the main thing we do, and if we look at care, as a sector of the economy, and if we look at paid care and unpaid care, and we uh, combine those things, not many countries have done this, but I know uh, Australia did some years ago. They found out that the care sector, paid and unpaid, is 66% of the economy. Well, that's huge. And the private companies have discovered this. And 
and uh, finance uh, uh, speculators have now moved into care because that's a safe haven for uh, speculative money. Uh, so I think this is real and it's part and it's the heart of the economy for good and for bad. Uh, yes. Um, and I think we uh, we have to, to to join the arguments and the literature on care uh, to the arguments for uh, universal basic income. Kathy Weeks, uh, in her book uh, The Problem Would Work, she uh, she draws a line from the early uh, Marxist feminist movements uh, on uh, wages for housework. Um, saying that there are so clear associations between this kind of thinking in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, um, and the arguments made for, for AUPI. Other feminist economists have been uh, writing about this, about what is included and excluded in the GDP, that has been an issue for 100 years more. Um, and it is very important to, to, to think about that. that work is also a lot of unpaid things, and in Norway, I think we are in a privileged position because actually uh, in Norway this is to some extent accepted uh, because statistics Norway has since 19, uh, the early 1970s every decade we make a time, big uh, time use uh, survey about what people do uh, over the day what kind of uh, activities they perform in the home so we count uh, the activities which are defined as unpaid work so I think here we have an agreement that the unpaid uh, caring and the maintenance uh, activities that are performed in the home, they are actually work, even if they are unpaid. And uh, this is great data and it could be used much more extensively to, to make the argument for, for uh, UBI uh, and for the gender effects of UBI because even if since the 1970s women entered the labor market a lot of the kind of production in the household uh, moved into the form of the economy um, and became visible in terms of money streams uh, and we have another Norwegian uh, economist Charlotte Fuden who has made a great argument about this shift from the household production to, 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 to the formal economy as a kind of uh, corresponding uh, uh, development to, to the transition from the agrarian to the industrial society. Uh, so there is also a kind of uh, economic argument about this figures of GDP, she says, in the 19 heydays of the growth era, they were inflated because some of this so-called growth, it was only uh, making visible parts of the economy that had been outside of the formal economy. Now it entered into the labor market and now it became visible. So all this growth was <coughs> real growth uh, in terms of consumption opportunities. Um, um, so I think we, we need to recognize the importance and the value of unpaid work as a necessary prerequisite for making the argument for the universal basic income. And uh, the gender argument of this is that um, women and men still live uh, relatively uh, in equal lives, even in Norway, even if women in Norway to a very large extent are part of the paid labor market, and women increasingly also work full time. We have a gender pay gap. Women and men work in different sectors, so women as a group have access to much less uh, money in terms of wages and also in terms of wealth. So bringing money into women's hands in an automatic, uh, universal way would contribute to gender justice. Having money on your, uh, one's own is very important for, for many reasons. And in the way, uh, the child benefit, which was introduced, you mentioned, in 1946, has had historically a very important role in uh, women's uh, economic autonomy. Because that was the first time that many women actually had money on their own, which could make a big difference. Uh, and I think this is a classic uh, feminist argument for uh, UBI. 
then there is an intersectional feminist argument for UBI. And that is where the arguments for UBI for power, poverty eradication, and for general justice is also a gendered argument because women tend to be at the bottom uh, layer of uh, the income pyramid and uh, in uh, positions of power. So there is also an argument that if we uh, reduce poverty, that would uh, in particular benefit those that are at the bottom, and uh, that is also gender. Um, and it would, um, we, many have said that already, um, the UBI would uh, shift the power between an employer and an employee. Uh, and as we have seen, uh, we have the Me Too movement. Uh, sexual harassment and abuse in the labor market is very strongly related to uh, inequal power relations with women at the bottom and men at the top being able to exploit people. If women had access to uh, a UBI, you could perhaps uh, be, be better able to, to maneuver uh, in, 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 the, in the labor market. Intracouple in economic inequalities. It's not very much studied, but uh, there are also inequalities within couples, uh, and it could be very important to have your own money, in particular in the context of violence and abuse. And of course, for those most uh, um, exposed people who are immigrating, for instance, who don't have their own money, uh, this could really make it. This could be a, a, a life saver, actually. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I came across basic income as a young researcher in the early 90s. I was interested but quite skeptical. Because the, I was studying European welfare states, and they were so strong and so embedded in society that an alternative, I saw then basically from as an alternative, was not viable at the time. I think that has changed a lot since then, mainly in uh, countries like uh, Germany and the UK, but uh, increasingly also in the Nordic countries, even Norway. Um, when at that time the poor were, were seen as outsiders not to be uh, emphasized by policy makers. They, they served a usual, a useful function by, by, by uh, stabilizing the universal system because the, the undeserving we kept outside. That's the paradox of the, of the universal welfare. They were, as, as I think put it uh, in the last session, they were invisible. But they are becoming more visible now. Um, we have had this emphasis on the poor since 2000. Uh, we have had this, uh, this uh, uh, emphasis on, on uh, immigrants. And in both cases, they're becoming more visible, but it's not helping them because they are both, uh, those two groups are seen as kind of targets for othering. They are not us. And that creates a more repressive welfare system. Um, so, going to these uh, shifts, uh, what we see is that to, to break down uh, the, the uh, the institutions that impact on basic income. We have the labor market, very important. We've heard a lot about that in the conference. We have the welfare state. We've heard about that as well. I would try to break it further down and look at the at a term that's not used very much in the Nordic countries, insiders and outsiders. Uh, I think we need to, to find a Norwegian word for that. Um, the in, outsiders are Insiders are people with a history in ordinary work, uh, which is the vast majority in Norway. Outsiders are people with no or a loose connection to the labor market, the invisible people that I talked about. Um, 
I have studied um, uh, outsiders mainly, and I've, I've had the, the privilege to follow this activation trend within the services for the minimum income for social assistance in uh, eight European countries and in the US since, the, since this policy came into being in the, in the mid-1990s. It's resulted in two big projects and two, two books, so I followed that through three waves of reform. And um, just briefly on that, this came as an import largely from, from the US, but in Europe we didn't want to use that ugly American word, workfare. We still instead invented the European word activation, which is still conditional but supposed to be nicer uh, and broader. And, uh, and uh, that was the case when I did my first study around 2000. What was happening in Denmark, in the Netherlands, in the UK? Look, maybe, maybe people are getting more opportunities, right to opportunities in addition to the right to uh, an income. So at that time, it was very mixed picture. But then this changed. The EU changed after 2003 to 2004. And by 2008, uh, activation in Europe had predominantly turned towards a repressive system, very much like the American system, designed more to get people off welfare than as the official viewpoint was to get them in to work. And, and that, uh, after the financial crisis, this, this pressure was not lifted. Instead, they just cut the activation programs. Netherlands cut them by, by 70%, all these programs, uh, in 2012. And instead, they moved more to administrative uh, curtailment of the rights of the individual, of, may, of closing the doors to NAV in Norway, to make it, everything had to happen on the computer. You could meet a caseworker. Uh, if you turned up five minutes late, you, were about, uh, you lost your benefit for the next month. Uh, there is a, the extreme case is the UK, and you should see the film, I, Daniel Clay, that, that can serve as a documentary of how far this has gone in, in the UK now. Um, what we saw, America has always been 10 years ahead. What, in, in 2000 already, the, the uh, American contributor to my book, uh, Wiseman, wrote that already then you could see a contagion of, 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 uh, uh, of workfare principles from the outsiders and into the groups of insiders. We see that very clearly also in Europe. In, 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 uh, in the U UK, there's no distinction between insiders and outsiders in welfare, hardly at all. And, and also you see that in Norway now. And you should be aware of what's, what's happening in Norway with this, um, uh, this uh, uh, turn towards conditionality and in administrative containment and time limits. That was Clinton's way to get rid of welfare. Time limits is now introduced in our intermediate uh, arrangement between sickness and permanent disability. We call it Arbeitsaufklarungspenge, uh, the, the kind of a, a transitional allowance for, the, for people who are not determined to be sick or able to work. They have introduced time limits and cut off 10,000 people and run them into social assistance. An increase in, in social assistance that's, that's documented by, by the state themselves now only because of that change. Then you start, if you cut on the undeserving and be tough with that, studies have shown that in the next election your, your uh, support in, in, in the election will go up. We know, in Norway we call it the, 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 the immigrant card. There are in Montana. That is, everybody or 90% will agree that you have to be tough on the others. 
Now it's us. Now it's the, the newspapers are full of of uh, of um, uh, people that work for 30 years and then they're cut off from the system after they were sick for three years and they have to sell their house. That is not acceptable to society. Then 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 you you create a totally new momentum. And by focusing on this, I'm using that as an argument why it's not invisible okay, anymore. It's, it's about, it's becoming a question about us. I could get sick and not get, get hold of a case handler when, when I was sick and needed a program and then suddenly I get a letter that next week your benefit is over and you have to go to social assistance, which for most people is shameful. So they then, because of the means test, they would have to rely on, on their spouse or maybe they have savings and that's not sustainable. So, so we are seeing kind of early beginnings of that in Norway now. Europe has already gone there, so, so the arguments for the, the arguments of the failure of the income maintenance part, not the service part, of the welfare state is strengthening the basic income argument. That is my message. But the system is also free university, free education, free uh, services, uh, which is a, an important part of it, but also active labor market policies. And the state uses 8 billion Norwegian kroner every year in the active labor market policies. And there's almost no discussion on how to use this money. 8 billion kroner, Norway is a small country. A lot of money goes into this, and a lot of money is wasted in the wrong way. And I work in uh, NAV, the Norwegian uh, Agency for Work and uh, Welfare, Labor and Welfare, for many years. And this is very shameful. And they almost work with this 8 billion kroner in secret in the Department of Welfare. So this is an important focus and one of the most important uh, issues uh, which I think um, which must be more focused on is, uh, is an issue which also is brought up by Knut Röhm at your institute, Alamona, where he says we have to use more uh, money on wage subsidies, which means that people who don't get work on the ordinary uh, labor market, they can get jobs with ordinary pay subsidized by the state. And this is also, for example, in the uh, uh, Labour Party uh, program now, which is uh, decided on this days, the problem is to get it from the program and through this Labour Department, they sit on it, they have three theories on why this doesn't work, and then they give the blame on, uh, on the Labour Unions, which they also scrape with their feet but uh, actually it's in the program of the um, Labour Party. So this is one example on how things um, could be changed if there was more focus on important issues with a lot of money floating around in the system. And then Norway has, in a way, an important tradition for universal system. The most important example of that is the universal pension system. And the, one of the reasons why that is important, there are two reasons why that is important. The first reason uh, is that many of the other systems follow the pension system. The social security system, through the system, follows the pension system. 
And then the social assistance system follows also, in a way, the pension system, where it should follow the pension system. If you look at social assistance, you see that it hasn't followed the pension system. We have a very strong organization called the Pensions Organization, Pensions for Women. They're very strong, they're very powerful. And organizations like mine and Belfast Alliance, they should cooperate much more with Pensions for Women because they're very powerful and they're very powerful in their cooperation, in their roots in the labor movement, in the uh, labor uh, trade uh, in, the, in the Norway. So another reason why this um, pension system is very important is that when it was created in the 60s, it was not only a system where the people that worked earned pension, there was also the basic what is it in English? I wrote it down. Um, minimum pension level. So that people that didn't, hadn't been to work, also they had a minimum pension level. So that if you had been a housewife or if you hadn't had work for some reason, you got a minimum level. And in the beginning they called it sati legya, and then now it's double the, the basic pension level. Now this is very important, and this is what the pension um, uh, organization works for, and they're always there as a pressure group. And the point is that you also got something if you hadn't worked, if you hadn't earned. So this was a kind of a basic income for all pensioners, and also for the ones that were disabled pension. They also had a basic income in this system. That's why the Norwegian pension system is so important. And we must, we that work for welfare, we must focus much more on the pension system because this is our actually basic income. Now, the third example of how this doesn't work, <coughs> five minutes, is the parental leave. This really shows how things disintegrate because parental leave in Norway, of course, is fantastic for the middle class. For the whole middle class, Everybody who works, who has had work for half a year, is fantastic. You get a whole year of leave. Now, in, in, for my three kids, I got three months, four months. Now you get a year. I mean, it's fantastic, plus uh, vacation. So it is a whole year, actually. So what happens if you hadn't, if you couldn't get work even for a half a month? Well, you didn't know that for half a year. You didn't even know the rules. So what happens to you? Then you, you just get a smaller amount of money. You don't even get the basic income, of the, the, uh, the basic pension of two times uh, the basic pension income. So what happened? Now our organization have tried to work for this uh, over um, the past few years. There really are a lot of people that won't listen to that. All over the political spectrum. Sector. I know ESPE, for example, they have it in their program. The Social Democrats don't even have it in the program. But does it help that ESPE has it in the program if they only talk about the Barnet Treat? They never talk about it. So what happens, and this is my last point, what happens when they get the government in two years and they start negotiating about how to use the money in two years? Well then, we're going to spread out more Barnet to the middle class and this group is not going to get their parental leave like the pension system says they should have. So we're losing off on the basic income. So these are my starting four points that, that we are working on in our organization. And it has to do, of course, with basic income, but based on the Norwegian uh, model of basic pension system that we have in our country. Practical solutions on how we can proceed to develop in the direction of a 
when you notice the divided by its minimum income. So I wanted to hear your opinion about the relationship between a universal basic income on the one hand and a guaranteed minimum income increases in the form of a more standardized right based uh, social assistance program in, in, the, in the Nordic uh, countries. How do you how do you consider uh, or what's your reflection on all of the differences in those types of um, approaches to standardize and uh, and show more predictable right based income for, for people? Anyone? Uh, <laughs> Personal opinions are not so interesting uh, because I have so many crazy opinions, so they wouldn't be worth much. But, but just in this case, I would say that, that, that I think we should move more of the guaranteed income that is for everybody. Just as we emphasized in, in the last uh, presentation, and that means that more of the more of the guarantees in society should be for everybody. I think there's a, really something wrong with. It many things uh, in, in connection to the discussion of the welfare state. For example, the, the, the concept of cost is, is related always to the sort of to market uh, things. They want this really redistribution. You take from somebody and redistribute it more equally on people. That's called a cost. But, but it's not a cost to society. It's not a cost. It, it is just a cost for those who lose money, but it's not for society, it's not a cost. And, and these things are the concepts here are sort of been diluted by uh, political, uh, I think, political tensions in society. That uh, everything is defined in the relationship between the capitalist and the worker. That's the definition of everything, it is, is in that the rights of people, that they, whether you are active or not, that is in that relationship uh, connected to the welfare And so therefore, I think. More, move more to the guaranteed for everybody, and that is a basic income element. Uh, but of course, this can be done in different ways, and I, I would be have a very strong opinion about that. We shouldn't quarrel about the, the different details. There are too many uh, competing, uh, uh, too many competing proposals in the sense that uh, you have sort of children with small differences. That, uh, that people are sort of quarrelling about differences. But a movement, a more guaranteed basic floor, I think that seems to be an agreement among many people that you should listen to. Uh, Eva, um, your question was, is, is um, a right, more rights-based social system alternative? Arguments for and against that. Uh, the main arguments are against. It's deliberate that we have a, a not a state, but a local authority that varies throughout the local authorities in Norway, social assistance. It was deliberate from the time uh, Gudmund Harlem, the, the father of you know who, most of you, uh, was minister in the uh, late 1950s. He was deliberate. He wanted uh, a rehabilitation program for the insiders. And he, and he says, those have to have rights. I interviewed him in 1987. Uh, they have to have rights and, uh, in place before we start their rehabilitation. And then he wanted a separate, he wanted that in place first, 1961, and then he wanted a separate system for the outsiders, with no rights, with uh, but, and the rehabilitation would be social workers. Then we got social workers growing in Norway uh, as, a, as a result of that. They should not have rights and it should be up to the local authorities. Since then, many uh, uh, parliaments have discussed the, the, the question of why don't we have a national standard for social assistance. One of the few countries in Europe that doesn't have that. And the main opponents have come from the, the left, the Labour Party, because they wanted this separate system so that they could strengthen the main thing, the state social security. And today they have a new group of, um, that's now dominating uh, uh, social assistance in numbers, above 50% immigrants. That doesn't happen, because that, that's very suitable for political othering. What could happen is if, as I mentioned initially, uh, ordinary people who have come to the end of the three years on, on, on uh, the transitional disability allowance 
will fall into social assistance. That would strengthen the argument. It's, it's kind of, you know, votes count, but, but who you are determines just to change the Norwegian political saying. <laughs> Well, I understand, I mean, the topic of this conference is the idea of basic income and how does that apply to uh, different, uh, very different systems of social organization or social policy organization in different parts of the world. And one thing that I have, um, and so you can't sort of say basic income and then that's the same thing one place, like you said in your um, uh, note here a while ago. So what thing uh, from basic income in the idea uh, can be applied in Norway? And I think uh, one thing that was mentioned in the last uh, conference, uh, last period, was the idea that if somebody had uh, the right to have a basic um, uh, income, then they would become prosperous in their energy to create something good. Now, this is a very important idea because but you don't have to change the whole pension and social security system to introduce this idea. So you have to fight for this idea. Now, take an example. You have now, for example, um, the disability pension. If you start working with, with disability pension, before you know, do that, your, your uh, housing lines will go away. So you have to change the rules so that, that, that you can work without, without everything going away, so that you, know, you, won't, you won't lose money for working and earning. So you have to be consequent in this way. And trust people, you know, it's wonderful you work, so you earn more, well that's great. You keep your housing allowance if you start working. That's one example. And I think uh, in the single parent um, uh, social, part of the social security system, this has partly worked for many years, that you could work quite a lot, you could go to school and you still kept your allowance. So this is, in a way, that could be a kind of a model of thinking. So I think this, for example, is an idea within the basic income which could be much more applied. And so I, I, don't, I, I think that in the social assistance, uh, one, you have now, uh, the whole family's income is seen together. I think you have to divide that, that's a feminist point of view, that the woman and the man, they have to be seen as two separate uh, income takers. And that is, uh, that now the women's movement, have, we have to start moving on this, for example. That we have, that that's a basic income for everybody and not following the rule of uh, marriage, saying that you have to support each other, but they have at least each person has a basic income, and then you have a right to study, and you have a right to this without getting the other partner losing money in that case. So that you have the freedom to move without moving against your own interest. And I think this can be applied within a very good universal system in many ways. Q&A session when the panelists are finished, or you can start thinking about your own comments and questions. Uh, my bit, and then another. But I would just uh, add a couple of practical uh, ideas or reflections following up on what you were saying, because I think actually in Norway we have uh, today and in the past we have several entitlements that are universalistic in their. Uh, uh, in the way they are designed, and they could be expanded as part of a stepwise uh, movement to the universal basic income. And uh, the one is what you said that uh, children's needs to be cared for should be what uh, uh, was at the basis of the parental leave right. entitlement rather than what parents have deserved in the labor market because every child needs to be cared for, right. and you should care for it, but you should have a kind of basic. Uh, subsistence in order to be able to provide that care. Uh, that is one thing, but I also think uh, the child, uh, the, the universal child benefit 
uh, it has not been regulated for 20 years, so until this year, a very, very small expansion. If uh, I have at least seen calculations that if the child benefit was um, uh, upgraded until the previous level that it was before it uh, was frozen 20 years ago, that would eradicate much of the child uh, poverty, and that is also maternal poverty in no way. So that would be a very simple uh, measure. Just and that, yeah. And another, another, another thing that you mentioned, the support for local parents. I think this is Norway actually had a universal system of support for local parents with no strings attached. Uh, except a big, small bit of paternalism that uh, the social worker might come home to you and count the toothbrushes in the bathroom. But as long as you were a long parent and you lived with your child and you cared for your child, uh, no one asked of you anything else that you cared for the child and you could claim it for 10 years. And a lot of long parents actually used that time, and in particular young Long mothers who did not have education, they used this uh, period in order to take education uh, and get on with their lives. Then it was cut um, around 20 years ago now, uh, from 10 to 3 years, and then uh, we could have a little more if you uh, were in education, and now it has been cut even more. And the, the effect of that, was, I mean, the intention was to liberate the mothers from being dependent on the state and uh, earn their own money in the common <coughs> autonomous. Uh, that did not happen to everyone. A large share ended up on other welfare benefits, which are means tested and uh, they are still in the system. And further restrictions in the recent years have further added to uh, child poverty and the poverty of own parents. So you could reintroduce and revitalize this system and say caring for children is work. It is very important. Uh, no parents, they have also a time poverty. They are only one person who is going to do the, both the pay work and the care work. Other families, there are two persons to do that. So it would be recognizing the value of the caring work that the parents do and to trust them to use the money for their own good and for the children's good. Yeah. No, no. No, 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 I, I want to. I just want to say in your argument and in your argument that you have to fight for this idea of basic income and not link it to a slimming of the welfare state. This uh, European survey that was referred to earlier today, that, uh, in that survey so they asked the Europeans uh, about um, uh, what do you think about basic income um, as a replacement for several social benefits, and that's not the basic income. And then Norway came very low, 33 percent. Yeah, uh, and Russia came very high, uh, 73 percent. Uh, so they have a, uh, a lot of benefits, and we have a very, very good one, very generous one. In the Norwegian uh, survey some years ago. Uh, um, they found that uh, 67 percent, I think, of the Norwegians were in favor of a basic income. But that was uh, the, the question was asked in an other context, in a, a social policy context, uh, contrary to the European question. So that's very important. It's not nothing to do with living the very state. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so then we'll take questions and comments from the floor. Yeah, we can also try to ask or we might have more short. Um, so, yes please. Um, as a welfare recipient myself, I'm intimately familiar with a lot of the flaws, of, the numerous flaws of the current system. However, I'm equally uh, familiar with how few fucks are given uh, to the plight of the poor and the disabled and the sick population by the general population. Uh, of course, this ties into what you said about the othering, uh, uh, which again is facilitated by the capitalist ideology and the work ethic and all these things. And so I'm increasingly of the suspicion that, uh, in terms of uh, like pragmatic strategy, if we want to implement UBI, uh, is it still a good idea to frame it in terms of welfare and, well, from, from like right wing uh, point of view, giving. Uh, money to 
on certain people, or should we rather uh, see it a uh, rhetorical ground to the right wing and rather concentrate on the economic arguments uh, around growth and uh, you know the MP or whatever? Very good question. Um, and it goes back to this in addition to or or instead of <coughs> what you are saying and what my what I've seen from research. My last research was a global project on poverty and shame and seeing how, how shame and loss of dignity is disabled to people, be it in Uganda or in Norway or in America, countries we study. Maybe if we can if if there is a bottom system like there is in most countries, maybe, and that has this negative impact on people, and usually it goes under the name of, uh, of minimum income social assistance, maybe that is a, a real opportunity to, to, to get rid of, uh, of the <coughs> repressive parts of that, make that more uh, a part of a foundation. Uh, because if you are to, to replace anything by a basic income, it has to be cheap. And this is cheap and it's a small part of the budget. Uh, compared to pensions, it's peanuts. Uh, so, so it, and it has more, more or less a more role in society. Um, and and if, if that could be achieved by preserving uh, other, other forms like entitlements that you've earned, uh, care for children when when there's only one care. Uh, if you can maintain that while at the same time getting rid of uh, of the, the remnant of the poor, which this really is, then that would be a good design. And last one. Uh, any other comments, questions? Well, I, I, I can, uh, I'd like to comment on that because I see that moral arguments and economic arguments go very well together. Because where the system doesn't work, it costs less, less to uh, change it than to keep it going in a hopeless, uh, hopeless uh, money, uh, I don't know what you call it, with eight billion out in the labor market policies that in part work but also in part won't work and money can be used in different ways. So you can use the argument and if you also use the argument that it's totally unreasonable that families that, that, uh, that have children that are poor don't get a minimum uh, pension, minimum uh, parent wage like everybody else. I mean it's completely unreasonable in a Norwegian context. So then we can say, well, we have the money for this. We're wasting money here and there and there. We can show that. Then the ones that worry about the money, they will listen. And the other ones, they will listen also to the moral argument. So I think you have to use the two together. But in our system, there is so much money floating around that we can, we can point to better ways of using the same money. Okay. Well, I think everybody here is here because they're in favor of a universal basic income, so if we weren't to make progress, it would be actually more constructive to talk about one of the, some, one of the problems and the challenges and pitfalls of the universal basic income and need to sort out. Um, but I'm also curious about the extent to which, um, since we all like the idea of the UBI, um, to the extent to to which we're talking about the same thing. Um, and obviously there's a difference between people who think that it should be a basic safety net, or should it be a real alternative to being a wage earner and a part of the regular job market. So it, it seems to me that a lot of the benefits only accrue when it's a real alternative to having a job and participating in the job economy. Um, and it would be nice to map out the extent to which people sort of agree about what this is all about. And one of the questions you could ask, for instance, um, is what do you think, if, if you had a UBI, how many would it be? And obviously that's going to depend on the you're in, but 
you could ask people, what percentage of the average income should the UBI be? And that may us give an idea about the extent to which we're talking about the same thing. I think we uh, are coming very close to the end of, um, of this session, so I think we could use his questions to, for you to comment on as I find around our, our comments. So, uh, what it considered to be the main challenges ahead of us, and uh, how do you define the basic income of one at which level? Are they, uh, I know this is a very large, heavy account, but the model perhaps also the potential for uplifting alliances. Uh, if you want to be researchers, academia, and uh, civil society organizations in this, in this area. So I'll give you uh, two minutes each just to have uh, one comment. Uh, I'm sure to start with you, Dishman. Yeah, you want to say something I'm not a specialist on, on UBI. I, I, so I, and there are lots of technical questions. I'm I'm struggling with them to, to understand them in spite of doing well first aid research. Um, but what what could be said is that uh, the the proposals that I've uh, come across is is putting things at the level that doesn't that doesn't compete with the main uh, transfer programs in certain in the Norwegian welfare state. And if that came as a basis, uh, um, it, it, even at the low level, it would do a lot away with the with the minimum income, the social assistance in different countries. Uh, maybe maybe even eradicate that. That wouldn't be too high a level and too high a percentage of average. Uh, wages um, and and if that is universal like it has to be then it would also and I'm taking that over to the to our economist friend Colin if that is up on the basis on a floor below a, a pension below a, a part-time wage wouldn't that also have an impact on on the on inequality which is a growing Problem also in uh, countries like Norway. Yes. Well, uh, there's a question for Colin. I'm going to just move on to my good if you want to say something. Um, yes. Uh, no, I, I am not an expert on uh, UBI either, so uh, I think I cannot. <laughs> I cannot answer all the technical issues. Um, and as I said, I think we should be pragmatic and we should think about the, the general idea of universal enlightenment, which is part of the idea that it is liberating and uh, has potential. And uh, in Norway, we, we are in a particularly privileged position where we actually have, uh, have some of these enlightenments uh, which could be expanded as a kind of stepwise and, and a gradual uh, transition. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. I think that the uh, guarantee basic income should be a sort of a human right. Uh, I think it should apply to all countries. Uh, of course, they have to be adjusted to local conditions in, the, in, in specific countries. You can't have the same guaranteed minimum income in Finland and in Namibia. I think that is uh, obvious. Uh, but I think it should be a part of a human right. But it doesn't replace the need for social insurance. It doesn't need. It doesn't replace it, the, the need for a lot of other kinds of intervention. And anybody who tried to sort of propagate for universal basic income as a replacement scheme for the welfare state in Europe, I think they lost in the beginning. Because there's, there's so many reasons why we need uh, welfare spending. So this is. They should be viewed as complementary processes, and I, I think they actually are. And I also am in favor of starting small. That uh, I think, for example, the guaranteed uh, basic income that will be, uh, say, I haven't had a proposal when we presented yesterday that so 10% uh, of the GDP per capita, for example, is a good uh, starting point. 
then as when the economy grows, then this uh, flow goes together with the with the with the income. If you don't get this uh, like the child allowances, this is going to be child allowances for grown-ups, and uh, but it is indexed to the national income. And then of course, then we can sort of come together and agree on, on higher percentages. Uh, uh, I mean, in favor, if I, if I had all the power, I'd be in favor of much higher percentages, but I don't think it's a political support for that. But then start, start small, get experience, and uh, but start with reforms, not start with the pilots. I think that's it. it I, this, this world is too full of pilots. Start small, and this is for how the world progress. Start small and, and learn from it, don't call it a pilot. Then this is a real process. Yeah, yeah, I feel like it's part of the human rights And I think it really is for many. But not to activate it much in the discussion. It's the right to be well fed is part of the human uh, rights declaration. Yeah, that's the goal. And with that, I thank uh, all the panelists for their uh, uh, contributions.